flip through it. And since y'all are all poets, I decided to do a reading based around poetry and forms and some things you might appreciate in terms of the structure. Um, so anyway, this is me on the cover. Um, I have a buddy at the Art Institute, Kevin Richard. He's our life drawing instructor at the Art Institute. He did the clown book of mine, if anybody has a copy of that one. But uh, this, he, one day I showed up at my desk and said, hey, I was flipping through a Rembrandt book and uh, I saw this thing about this poet back in the 1600s and you're the only poet I know, so here. And he dumped this oil painting on my desk, which was actually this that he'd taken from a photograph. And yeah, I know, isn't that amazing? He, he transposed a photo of me into an oil painting, so I looked like a Dutch master as I'd be telling him to be on a cigar box or something. And I uh, said, so, dude, that's got to be the cover of my next book, right? So uh, they scanned it in and made it, and it's kind of humorous. And the book actually is kind of a change for me. I was talking with my buddy Larry Thomas a few years ago, and he said, you know, you ought to start publishing things that are a little kinder and gentler. Because I do have a bit of a reputation for having an edge if you see me read a few times. And uh, so I decided that in the next few years I'd be publishing things like love poetry and spiritual poetry and things like that. So I dug through uh, old manuscripts and things and I found a bunch of poetry with spiritual themes. So that's what I'll be reading today. Um, first off, uh, let me start with a couple tributes to friends and family. Uh, my sister had breast cancer a few years ago. She's fine now. They removed it all and she's doing great. But uh, she had to go through chemotherapy, unfortunately. And uh, this was a poem I wrote for her about um, that experience. It's called In the Chemotherapy Lounge for Lorita. Sorry to say, I don't want to return to this room again. To stay away will signal a return to health. A disappearance of this stealth killer silently stalking my blood. The only chairs here are cells to sink into. I heard one man complain, the TV was too loud. Yet it connected those adrift on these chemical waves to a life outside this life, saving and stealing life. And the cold of the room pricked my skin, despite the drowsy maw of sleep I always crossed. When I awoke, I spoke in low tones, like those who wander graveyards, knowing ghosts. Thank you. Oh yeah, I normally say hold your applause to the end, or your bats, or your, you know, you're going to throw something at me. That way I can catch it at the end of it. You know, whatever they throw. All right. Uh, if, you were, if you're following along your hymnal, uh, this is on page 42. Uh, a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine named Byron Scott, uh, he was a guitar player in one of my bands in Austin. He passed away a few years ago. Uh, and I happened to be in Ireland at the time when I got the news and uh, I was going to the Yeats uh, exhibit at the Irish Library and some of y'all may know that very famous poem that uh, Ye Auden wrote for Yeats about the death of Yeats and Auden. Well, I happened to be there uh, and so I wrote this uh, based on that form uh, for my friend Byron Scott, <coughs> rest in peace, who is one of my best musician brothers. I love you, Byron, wherever you are. And so this is called In Memory of Byron Scott, Austin Music Legend, and he really was. R.I.P. I reach across the miles to you the last time we speak. Your mother's will, your daily pills, I know you need a break. You ship an envelope to me, the last handwriting I see. I call and call, no answer there, until the news fills my ear. All instruments agree, silence, your brilliance, no sense. I reach across the years to you, the last time we jam. Our joint songs, 
our spirits strong. You made me better than I am. I play the ancient tapes we made, what's left of what we shared. I cry and cry. No answer there. Your life force fills my ear. All instruments agree. Silence, your brilliance. No sense. I reach across the worlds to you the next time we meet. Your body gone, truly alone. Death is an evil cheat. Your friends left on this earth, the place of all our births, vow to find an answer there. Our love for you fills our ears. But all instruments agree, silence is now what's left us here. I, I know, the first time I read that was in Austin and some old friends of his had shown up. I, I almost cried when I was reading that. I, it was hard for me to get through that. He and I were roommates and bandmates. And, I don't know, one time I read a quote, I think it was Frank Zappa of all people, who said this. So that you know, playing in a band with somebody is like the most intimate thing you can do, except for being a, you know making love, being a partner with somebody, because you learn so much about them by interacting musically and so forth. And um, I just love that. Um, let's find something a little more cheerful, all right? Um, my friend Rebecca, thanks for showing up. Hey, uh, she's a psychology teacher at the Art Institute, so I picked this poem out for her. I'm, Shout out to you. Um, this poem, I wrote it in uh, Panama, on the beach in Panama. I was with my partner, Susan, former partner now. And uh, I don't know if you guys know about this uh, magazine, First Line, up in Dallas, where they provide you with the first line and then you add. Uh, I think the guy's name is David, too, actually, David. Uh, I can't remember his last name right off the top of my head. But he has this thing where he gives you the first line every quarter. They have a quarterly prompt, it's a prompt in the business, as we call it. <laughs> and uh, they give you this first line, right? And you're supposed to write to the first line. So Susan and I went on vacation in Panama to some all-inclusive on the beach. And so I bring down the line, and I'm sitting there trying to write. And I have to write like five different versions. I write a sonnet, and I write a villanelle. And finally, she's like, you're, you're a freaking workaholic, dude. We're here to relax. I'm like, no, 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 I got to get it right, you know? <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I wrote a prose poem. And this is the, pro and that's why the form part, right? So this prose poem uh, was written about this first line. And the reason I dedicate it to Rebecca, my psychology professor friend, is because uh, this happened to Susan when she first moved to New York. She moved into some apartment where all these affirmations were scrawled on this mm mirror in the apartment and uh, so most of this is actually true based on what Susan was telling me on the beach so I kind of you know by the way don't ever date a writer right <laughs> that's good for the camera all right uh, you know source material anyway affirmations to go it was her silent affirmations that kept her from going completely insane like a failed actor, she scrawled them in lipstick on the bathroom wall. Every morning, these mantras greeted her as she washed her face. I am a beautiful person. I have a powerful voice. I can taste success on the horizon. The world is mine to command. Charlene auditioned every afternoon to a room full of indifferent producers. Roaming through multiple personas, she soon found herself lost. At night, the various meetings kept her spirits bright. I am an alcoholic. I must surrender to the higher power. Today is the first day of the rest of my life. I have no control over this world. On her way home, she stopped for Chinese takeout, always ordering two dishes so the cashiers wouldn't think she was alone. Back in her apartment, after the sweet and sour, 
she opened her dour fortune. Tomorrow, you will relive this sorrow. Mm. Yeah, 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 I know. It was cool that he published it. And then it was a true story. Susan told me she actually did that when she first moved to New York. She'd get two <laughs> Chinese foods so people wouldn't think she was alone. Like, you're in New York. No one cares. <laughs> and then she goes, well, I ate the next one the next day. Well, that's true. Good point. All right. How about a couple of sonnets for the poets in here, all right? All right, we all know about the Elizabethan sonnet, so I won't bother to be pedantic, Professor. <laughs> this first one is called Finding Meaning. It was published in the uh, Reflections 60th Anniversary Anthology of some, somebody, somewhere. I don't know what 60th anniversary of what? See, I don't know. Horribly marked. Thank you, Dustin. Just kidding. Finding Meaning. When every stormy evening a bird sings lacerated lullabies of stark grief. Puddles of flea larvae will soon take wing, live their only life unaware how brief a frenzied flight toward light can really be. Soon the storm is babbling at a mirror. More power to me, more power to me. Gray clouds are mounds of flea infested fur. Foul, ill winds blow chill across still, thin skins of those soulless clones who fail to savor the intricate beauty we live within, despite the often sour, bitter flavor. Where does the bird, the storm, fit in, you ask? Finding meaning here, my friend. That's your task. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, just a few more. And by the way, the book it is dedicated or was published by Transcendent Zero Press. And I told Dustin that all proceeds go to the Dustin Pickering Memorial Relief Fund. Of course, if he doesn't show up to sell his own books, the relief fund will be bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> Second sign. <laughs> called Spirit Sonic. I have no heart, no beating, living soul. I feel nothing when I hurt those I love. That special, sacred spot is a mere hole. No holy downpour will fall from above. I have no core, no spirit sprite within. I roam this world an indifferent creature, buffeted, battered, safe in this iron skin, a cold, too bold, impure sinecure. I have no hope, no faith in tomorrow, no way to navigate beyond this trap, just dust, dirt, Earth, bone, blood, material. What can remove this eternal sorrow? Perhaps somewhere I'll find a hidden map to rediscover what is spiritual. And two more? Okay. Um, some of you guys, or probably I know some of you, we're in the Metabolist Anthologies. Um, were you at that one that they did at the Jung Center? Yes. Yeah, yes. okay, all right. So uh, Reifenberg, no, I'm sorry, this is a side. Reifenberg comes up to me and he says, what the hell is your poem doing in this book? It was a spiritual book. And uh, I said, gee, gee, Dan, nice to see you too. And uh, he goes, this is the most freaky poem I've ever read for being in a spiritual book. And of course, then he gets up and starts talking about being in some acid trip out in the desert or something. And I'm like going, well, Dan, yours wasn't exactly right in the chapel of uh, the Episcopal Church. <laughs> so, I mean, what are you talking about? But anyway, uh, so, true story, right? Um, this poem, uh, I was reading about this uh, cannibal. I know, and this doesn't sound very spiritual, by the way, but it'll, it'll get there. <laughs> so, I'm reading this thing online. Uh, maybe you all heard this story in Germany. Uh, this guy advertised to be eaten 
He basically yeah. put out an ad. You heard about that story? Yeah, what an... I see, I'm always attracted to these bizarro things, you know. Inspiration, you know. And so uh, I was like, what in the world? So the guy answers the ad, shows up at his house. I guess they have a dinner party, except he's the meal, you know. So he actually kills the guy, he cooks him and eats him. And it seems to violate uh, not only legal precepts, but moral precepts, at least in my world. I don't know. A couple of questionable <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, there are some questionable aspects to that. I don't know. So, uh, of course, I was inspired. And uh, I, so I wrote this poem, and then uh, the spiritual call came out from Metabolus. And I sent in a couple other things. I really didn't think they'd pick this one. But as usual, as all of you know who've published, you never know what an editor is going to do. It's the complete crapshoot. It's like being at Vegas and going, come on, seven. And then sometimes you get snake eyes, and sometimes you get 11, and you bet on the come, and I don't even know where my money went. And I'm being you know, fleeced by a hooker in the elevator later on. I don't know. <laughs> None of that's ever happened. In any event, take, eat. This is my body with what we in the business call an epigraph. <laughs> Self-confessed cannibal advertised online for a victim, and a man showed up, ready to be mutilated and eaten before death. The case of Arwen Muiz, if I'm pronouncing that right, and you can find that at www.freerepublic.com. Who is more spiritual? The cannibal, or the man who offers himself up to be eaten like an animal, and as his dark blood fills the cup, whose thirst is worse? The one who drinks, or the one whose life force slowly drains? How can one know what he thinks? If this last pain cancels all prior pains or only crowns them and whose hunger is more intense the one dismembered or the human flesh butcher chef and consumer who lapses ecstatic when this moment's remembered and who are we to judge these two people whose sincere desires the other has gratified. Transubstantiation, not sanctified by steeple, still leaves hosts and guests satisfied. <laughs> yeah, it's more like what I normally write. It's disturbing to say the least. And two quick things. Number one, speaking of chapels, I am giving a reading next week at the... Uh, Episcopal Church in downtown Midtown. Yeah, it's going to be really cool. Uh, Robin Davidson, whose new book is fantastic, by the way. I just wrote a review of it. Um, Luminous Other. I strongly recommend it. Ron Starbucks said he'd be here. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, Ron has been exchanging some emails about this thing, and I think he's got some things to do with this. But uh, yeah, Ron is the host. Ron Starbuck. I'm reading. Uh, Robin Davidson is reading. There's a piano player. Apparently, does uh, improv. It's in a beautiful space downtown, uh, Midtown actually, at Trinity Episcopal Church in the Morrow Chapel. I was there last year, they did a four quartets reading for Elliot. It was pretty awesome. They read one of the quartets, had a piano interlude, next quartet, piano interlude. And reading in a chapel, I can honestly tell you, I've never read in a chapel before. So I'm really gonna have to you know, get spiritual. You'll, you'll feel sanctified. I, no, I don't feel sanctified. Where is my communion? You know, that's a, you might hear an echo depending upon. Yeah, that's it. The yeah. echoes in those places are so beautiful because a lot of them were constructed prior to amplification. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, this, this room has, has got great acoustics. I, yeah, I was blown away by how fantastic it was. I went to the Elliot thing, and uh, I, I was you know, honored to be asked to read here, quite frankly. Uh, so it's um, Trinity Episcopal Church, 1015 Holman Street, um, Friday, June 20th, starting at 7 p.m. So if you guys can make it out, that's great. I didn't make any copies of the flyers, so the only one I've got. You can uh, copy it over at lunch or whatever. And uh, I'll send this last poem out to Billy. 
Thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome. That's a hell of a drive to make, huh? <laughs> so this one's for you. Um, last poem. Uh, I was reading a bunch of uh, Native American mythology at one point. A friend of mine had this book of Native American myths and legends, origin myths from Native American cultures. I have some Native American in me. Um, you can probably see it. I didn't think about my, you know, they, they hide that in your family a lot, right? You know, uh, because of the stupidity of racism. And um, so when I go to Europe sometimes, people will come up and say, you're obviously American, look at your cheekbones. <laughs> I never thought about it, you know. And I also tan quite well, which I thank my Native American ancestor for, um, in any event. So I'm reading through this mythological, uh, it's origin myths and uh, flood myths and various myths of the Native American cultures. And I took a couple of them and kind of transformed them into poetry and um, put a couple in this book because they seem to fit. So I'd like to thank everybody for listening. Um, if you want a copy of this book and Dustin doesn't bother to show up, I may have a few extras in my briefcase, okay? Um, I don't know what he's selling them for, and really, I promise him I would let him have the money. So I might run out at, before y'all leave and get hit the phone and call him, see what the hell's going on with him. Dustin, love you, man. <laughs> and thank you all for listening. Okay? Yes, transportation issues yeah. all the time. Boy, I, can you just put a blank and then issues? And they capitalize it. <laughs> <laughs> he knows, he knows. Don't worry. Hey, I gave him a damn book, all right? So, you know, that's all I can do for him. Love you, Dustin. All right. This is for you, Billy. Two ghostly lovers. There was a young man who had a cold heart. A brave warrior praying for right to win out. He loved a young woman, though both grew up bitter. His words not just lies, so he might lay with her. One day, he said, the tribe needs stout horses. I must lead the raid and guide through rough courses. I will return soon. Then we'll seal our bond. She said, I will wait until you return from this crusade beyond. However, the warrior's deep passion for battle caused his soul to grow lost amidst the rabble. The girl, angered amidst her heart's rubble, waiting for their union as salvation from trouble. Then once on a hunt, he saw a fine dwelling. Its sun moon design fired his soul to sing. It's my woman. Is she still loving and beautiful? As he saw her still perfect on a buckskin quilt. They shared a fine meal then she shed his war shirt. Her gentle fingers traced his scars where he'd been hurt. Then they pleasured one another, tasted sweet bliss. Their unions always sweeter than any dream of his. But when the young man awoke the next morning, beside him, lay her skeleton, a smile in her skull. That young woman had died as his spirit roamed. Now only her spirit remained in their home. The warrior howled in anguish, then ran in cold fear, not knowing why, not knowing where. In madness, his words and eyes wandered strange. He was never in his right mind again. Mm.
That seems like an awfully depressing way to end, doesn't it? I don't know, man. Let me send with something more positive than that, man. I'll, give you, I'll just give you a quick here. Right? You haven't given me any credence to believe that you have anything in there more positive. I, I know. I, I, I'm not sure I do, to be honest with you. Uh, oh, here we go. The truth. This is positive. Maybe. I don't know. It's based on the Gnostics. Anybody read the Gnostics? Elaine Pagels has a great book about the Gnostic Gospels if you are interested in early Christian heresies. I'll mention that next week at the church. <laughs> the heretic that I am, really, deep down, a heretic. The truth, and this will be it. The truth itself speaks to me. I am the Logos. I am the Gnosis. The spirit trips the switch in me. Suckle the bottle, the nipple of life. Truth tastes intoxicating. And I surely love a buzz. <laughs> Your mind is fine. Dissonance dissipates. Oh, okay. Thank you guys for listening.